So tonight we are going to be covering the nutritional needs of you and your baby in each trimester. And we'll cover a little bit about uh, planning for pregnancy as well. Um, foods to focus on, managing morning sickness, preparing for the birth in terms of food, um, meal preparation after the birth, a um, little bit of touching on breastfeeding, tiredness, sleep, just little bits at the end because that's quite a lot of topics already. So it'll be an overview of all of these things and diet uh, and your post baby uh, body. So um, you may be familiar with um, the critical window. You might have heard that being spoken about. So that is the first 1000 days um, of life. So it's the time from conception all the way through to um, the child's second birthday. So this um, is a unique period of opportunity for the foundations of optimal health, growth and neuro neural development um, across the lifespan. So what happens in that period is really important for the child's future health. Um, and um, there's something called epigenetics, which is the environment around the fetus, which um, it changes the expression of their genes. And so nutrition is one of these parts of their environment that can change the expression of their genes for the better or for the worse. So that's wh why it, how it has a impact is because yes, it's directly affecting their genes. So this means that your diet in the lead up to pregnancy and then during pregnancy, as well as what the child eats um, in the first two years of their life can affect your child's future risk of things like obesity, type two diabetes and heart disease. And I always have to say at this point that um, if you're towards the end of your pregnancy or this isn't your first child and you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure I've been eating ideally or oh, I didn't eat ideally with my other children um, is to say not to worry about it. Don't feel guilty about it because obviously it's one factor, but the idea is that yeah maybe you'll get a bit more information tonight about it and you can do as much as you can um and even if it doesn't apply to you now it might be something that you share with other people or share with your offspring in later life um because obviously they may one day be having children of their own and so their their uh, nutrition habits later on in their life will also be important to your future offspring um, so, or their future offspring, your future grandchildren. <laughs> so, um, if you're planning for a pregnancy, um, I, some of you listening might not actually be pregnant yet. Um, so this is a very brief overview of the key nutrients only. We're going to be talking more about sort of diet as a whole, and it all applies whether you're pre-pregnancy or pregnant or post. Um, but some of the key nutrients, so for most people, the only supplements you'll need to take before you fall pregnant are folate and vitamin D. Um, so but if you're struggling to conceive, um, then I would recommend individual advice from a dietitian because there may be other supplements or certain nutrients that you could optimize in your diet that might affect your chances of falling pregnant or carrying to term. So if it's something that you wanted more individual advice on, then um, there might be other things recommended if I were to speak to you individually. But um, likewise, if you are maybe a bit of a fussy eater, some adults class themselves as fussy eaters, so you have limited foods that you like to eat, then you also might benefit from other nutrients that aren't listed here. But the, the, the key one that most people know about is the folate, which is also known as vitamin B9. So it's a B vitamin um, and it's essential for numerous bodily functions, um, for example, making and repairing DNA um, and also producing healthy red blood cells and to prevent anemia. Um, and we can't synthesize, so we don't make folate in our bodies, which means it's an essential nutrient, so we have to be consuming it through our diet on a regular basis as well. Um, so that's folate. Folic acid is the, the synthetic form that we get in supplements um, and also in fortified foods. So in pregnancy or when you're preparing for pregnancy, it's recommended to take this supplement because the natural folate is quite unstable and the amount that's in the food can be variable 
because of cooking and the way food's prepared, some of the folate might be lost. And also we don't necessarily absorb all the folate from that food. Um, and so to guarantee that you're getting enough, the folic acid supplements are recommended because we tend to absorb that very well. Um, but I'd always recommend getting natural sources alongside um, the supplements. And so, yeah, the reason we are recommending to take them is because of neural tube defects. So um, that is the failure of the neural tube at the back of the top of the spine to close um, during the early um, stages of the fetus being formed. So it actually closes usually between 18 and 26 days of conception. So it's really early on, which is why you need to be optimizing your folate intake before um, you actually fall pregnant, because most of us don't really realize we're pregnant um, until until it's pretty much happened already. Um, and so the other thing to know about folate is that some women will have an increased requirement. So if you have diabetes, celiac disease, if your BMI is over 30, or you have a history of epilepsy, or if you have a history of having had other um, babies with uh, neural tube defects, then usually the dose is five milligrams of folic acid. So it's much higher dose compared to the 400 micrograms, it's five milligrams. So I would, if, you, if you're at that, in that at risk category, then you should definitely be speaking to your GP and getting them to advise on the correct dose for you. Um, the other, um, so that's a lot about folate, <laughs> just so you fully understand that. Um, and then there's um, calcium, which are, are um, requirements are a little bit higher. So I'd recommend aiming for a thousand micrograms per day. Uh, the BDA, British Dietetic um, website, has some fact sheets. So if you Google BDA fact sheets, um, then it will bring up all the information on lots of things to do with nutrition, but there's a calcium diet sheet there, for example, and you can look at what your requirements are and how much calcium different foods contain. So you can do a little tally up of whether you think you're getting enough or not. Um, if you're using plant based alternatives, such as some of the plant milks, making sure they're fortified with calcium. Um, and then the vitamin D is the recommendation is 10 micrograms a day, you get lots of higher doses there's not much harm to taking the higher doses but the one what you need the minimum is 10 micrograms and then um you could keep a food diary if you wanted to look how you were doing for these things moderate caffeine we're going to be talking about that a bit more for pregnancy um but obviously there isn't such the need when before you've fallen pregnant to uh maybe reduce your caffeine so much but it's would probably be beneficial to just start if you drink a lot of caffeine start reducing it down again just because you won't necessarily know you're pregnant straight away reduce alcohol for the same reasons um obviously increase your fruit and vegetables um and then avoid um foods high in vitamin a again it's because vitamin a can form it's we store it in our liver and then if there's too much the baby stores it in their liver and it become can become toxic to them and cause abnormalities so again because you don't know necessarily immediately that you're pregnant you want to sort of reduce those the vitamin a content um when you're prior to falling pregnant so that is a very quick overview of some of the key nutrients for uh, pregnancy and will some of the other things we discuss will be relevant too. So then in the first trimester, there's some key nutrients again here. Um, so iron is a mineral that the body needs for growth and development, and your body uses iron to make a protein that um, in the red blood cells that then carries oxygen to all parts of your body, and also obviously to your baby. Um, and we also need iron to make hormones some hormones. Um, and so during pregnancy, our a woman's blood increases by on average 50%. Um, so 50% extra blood going around your body. So you'll need 
So you'll be producing more of those proteins to carry the oxygen around and you'll need so you need more iron. And it's quite common for, for women to uh, um, have slightly lower iron in pregnancy. And it's one of the ones to focus on your intake of before you fall pregnant as well. So you can really optimize that beforehand because again, we store it. Um, so if you can optimize the amount that you've got stored, then that can help see you through pregnancy. Um, B12 is needed also for red blood cells as well as DNA um, and for the brain and the nerves. So um, I've put some of the sources there, meat, fish and dairy basically are our only sources, animal products. So if you don't eat any animal products, then I would always recommend taking a B12 supplement. So if you're vegan, for example, or if you just really don't have very much meat or dairy um, in your diet. So um, but if you say someone that only had it, if you like a little bit each week, you probably will be getting enough. Um, and then um, meat and dairy eaters will also be getting enough of the B2, the riboflavin, but uh, vegans need to ensure that they're eating a variety of foods that contain it, such as yeast extract, Marmite, or similar brands, uh, products, um, or nutritional yeast, uh, quinoa, you can get some breakfast cereals that are fortified with it, um, leafy greens, avocado, almonds, and mushrooms are sources of, of B2, but we'll talk about that a little bit again later. Um, and then, as I said previously, maybe you're just a, someone that just doesn't have a very much variety in their diet. So it might be that you want to either focus on increasing those foods that you really like, that are sources of these nutrients, um, or that you might need to have a general supplement. So the, there's lots of pregnancy um, multivitamins out there. Um, so they're all appropriate, but as I said at the start, for those wanting to fall pregnant, the key ones are folate and vitamin D, and that really stands for when you are pregnant as well. They're the only ones you really need and can't get through diet, unless you say you're limited, in which case you might want to just take a, a multivitamin that's specific for pregnant. Um, and I've put vitamin A at the bottom here, as in the sources of vitamin A, because it's good to include the sources like orange and yellow fruits and vegetables, eggs, green leafy vegetables as well. So you want those kind of those plant sources of vitamin A um, because they, it is important for eye health um, and the immune system. But I say you just don't want those foods such as liver that are high in vitamin A or supplements containing them. So you do want a specific uh, pregnancy multivitamin, but I don't recommend a particular one because they're all meeting that need in the same way. And you can pay all sorts of money for multivitamins, but there's, there's not really evidence that one's superior to another because they all have to adhere to certain uh, guidelines. So during pregnancy, there are changes in carbohydrate and fat metabolism. Um, more insulin is produced by your body and insulin is a hormone that helps us get sugar out of our blood into our cells. So it's meeting that extra sort of need for energy for your baby. Um, and um, there's reduced lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat and increased fat deposition, especially around the breasts and the buttocks. So it's all pre preparation as well for, for later on. But um, it's all led by the increase in our hormones, such as estrogen, progesterone and the insulin. Um, and they, they, they favor the fat deposition, um, which creates that accumulation of your fat stores. And that peaks at around 10 to 13 weeks of gestation, so quite early on. Um, and that's before the fetal demands for energy um, to support their extensive growth. growth. So you, you accumulate that, those, those energy stores, those fat stores early in pregnancy. And then at the end of your pregnancy, when the baby's really growing and putting on weight, 
that's when they're going to use it. Um, so um, your energy requirements are mainly met um, through eating carbs, basically, um, which is the same for, for most of us. But um, that I say that increase in insulin is so that you can really utilize those carbohydrates and those sugars that you're eating. Um, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that you have to eat more. <laughs> um, so I've I called it tongue and cheek eating for two because you are eating nutrients for two. But I think most people now know that you don't need to eat more calories. You're not eating the energy for two because your body has all those mechanisms that I just touched on for making sure that your baby gets all the energy it needs without you increasing your intake of energy. Um, so in the UK, we don't have any recommendations for weight gain during pregnancy. You won't be sort of given a, a figure um, by anyone, but as a rough guide, if you are healthy BMI at the start of your pregnancy, you would gain between 10 and 16 kilos over the course of your pregnancy. So one and a half, two and a half stone would be a kind of usual weight gain, uh, but it does depend on your starting weight. So um, this is an example of how much you might gain depending on your BMI. So if you had a BMI over 30 at the beginning of your pregnancy, you might be expected to gain as little as six kilos. So obviously I say, you, our bodies are programmed to give the baby all the energy it needs and we don't actually need to consume too much more and if you're um you've already got some fat at your disposal it will be <laughs> redirected where it needs to be um so i say this is just a rough guide because i wouldn't um i don't think it's important necessarily to focus on your weight which we will talk about um but if you're focusing on healthy eating and eating adequate amounts, then say your baby will get what they need. Um, so come back to the kind of general healthy eating guidelines, which means choosing wisely from each food group. So you need carbohydrates, as I said, that is your the main energy source for you um, for building up those energy stores for later on for baby as well. So choosing carbohydrates that are mostly high in fiber, so whole grain, and low GI, which I'm not going to go into tonight. But again, if you um, want to look into it, there is a fact sheet um, about it. So that's just types of carbohydrate that are more the sugars from them are more slowly released into the blood. So that can help with our insulin levels. Um, and I mentioned gestational diabetes just briefly later on. But maybe if you are at some point, I'm fortunately um, diagnosed with gestational diabetes, then low GI might be something you want to look into uh, more specifically. And then select, so there's a slight increase in protein requirements in pregnancy, it's not huge. And again, we don't actually make extra recommendations for it here in the UK, some countries do, um, but choosing a mixture of animal and plant proteins, um, if you're a meat eater, then trying to get in some beans and pulses into your diet as well. Maybe some tofu is really beneficial for the fiber content and just general health um, and well-being as well. Plenty of fruits and vegetables. I've said that already. So as a guide, as one serving is 80 grams. So I think most people know about eating their five a day. So maybe if you're like, oh, yeah, I have vegetables with my meal, it might just be worth seeing. Well, do I have like the equivalent of a portion, so roughly 80 grams, or am I actually having a really small amount of each of them, even though I'm having three, it's not that big a portion. Um, so in general, at a main meal, our plate, half our plate should be full of vegetables. Um, and then focusing on unsaturated um, fats. So I think again, um, avoiding those saturated fats. Most people um, know that there's kind of good fats, bad fats. So the, the bad fats are the saturated fats, um, which aren't good for our heart and they're found in animal products. Um, so you want to be focusing on um, fats from nuts and seeds, olive oil, avocado. Um, those are the sort of healthy unsaturated fats. And then the other one, which I will be talking about again later as well, is the omega-3s. 
So the omega-3s uh, fatty acids, they come from oily fish, but they also, you can get them from chia seeds, linseeds and walnuts. Um, and so, yeah, I so said, I'm gonna talk about the omega-3s a bit later, um, but I say, so generally, you know, this slide means you want to be avoiding processed food as much as possible. It doesn't mean you can't have any, um, but just, yeah, ultimately, you want to be eating the, the best you can. So avoiding fatty meats, avoiding fried foods, processed snacks. So processed snacks often from supermarket and, and similar, um, like biscuits and things, they contain hydrogenated fats that basically act like saturated fats. So again, they're just really not good for um, us and they're not great for baby either. Um, so I've talked about specific nutrients and I've said most of them you can get through diet apart from vitamin D and folate. Um, but um, if you wanted to take a supplement for whatever reason, there are the healthy start vitamins that you can get free if you think you're eligible um, and you can ask your midwife or health visitor for access to those vitamins. So there are um, supplements available for free for those that need to access them. Um, I've already said avoiding vitamin A. So if you don't like fish um, and you don't eat walnuts, chia seeds or linseeds regularly, um, by regularly I would mean pretty much daily. So a serving would be six walnut halves or a tablespoon of chia seeds or a tablespoon of linseed. Um, so if you aren't having oily fish in your diet and you're not having the seeds, then you might consider uh, omega-3 supplement and I know that some of the uh, pregnancy vitamins also they come with some omega-3 supplements um, and so they can either be fish oil ones or they can be there's a, a vegan alternative which is made from algal oil which is oil from an algae um, but I've just, I just want to say, I'm, I'm happy for anyone to email me if they want to take an omega-3 supplement, email me for a recommendation of one because you don't want to be taking large doses. And so many of the companies sell really large doses of um, omega-3s. And there is some research that's recently come out to say that omega-3s can be really beneficial, um, but that high doses can be harmful. So it's something you don't want to be taking. Um, so if you can get it through diet, all the better. Um, and I've touched on um, like vegan mentioned people that aren't having much meat or dairy before, but just to outline it here that for vegan special attention needs to be given to riboflavin, B12, iodine and calcium. And for vegetarians and vegans, you need to be making sure you're getting enough iron, zinc and vitamin D. And that's not to say that you can't get enough of those on um, plant based diets. It's just to make sure, because, again, if you're not getting that variety of foods in your diet, you may be falling short on some of these things. And yeah, if you obviously you'll all you'll all be able to I've put it the sources of these nutrients on the previous slides, but if you wanted to look at it written down in a different format. There's those fact sheets that I've mentioned, and obviously there's the Vegan Society as well that has lots of fact sheets. So they'll give you all the different sources of those key nutrients if you aren't sure that you're consuming enough of them. But I'm happy again as well to have questions emailed me to me. Um, so Ruth, I can't before you about... move on, oh, yeah. I do have a question. Someone is saying, is it okay to take omega-3 fish oils in pregnancy? So I guess is that okay? Is it okay to take supplements on top of you know a diet with omega-3s in? I mean, how much yeah. is the recommended dosage, perhaps? Yeah. So the recommended dose I've put here. So normally I wouldn't recommend up to more than 500 milligrams of omega-3 so usually with the fish oils it, or the, the fish oils it's a combination of DHA and EPA um so then it will say 500 milligrams just of both of them um so yeah it was more some because if it's one that's come with your pregnancy vitamin it's pro it's probably absolutely fine it's just that you can buy some mega doses out there um so it's absolutely is fine and safe to take them 
um, but just not mega doses. So if someone wants to email me with their specific one and I can just check what the dose is, um, then I'm happy to do that as well. Um, if that doesn't answer the question um, already. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I say it really is a lot of the evidence for um, omega threes and the benefits for omega threes is it comes from the whole fish. So there's something about consuming the whole fish that gives us the benefit, and the supplements don't always do it for us. So I say take supplements if you want to, if you really can't meet it through diet, but if you can meet it through diet, it's always the best way. Um, and we are going to talk about fish <laughs> in more detail shortly. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't do a, uh, talk about pregnancy about, without mentioning what not to eat. Cause that's often what people first think about when they fall pregnant is like, Oh no, what can I not eat now? I can't eat cheese. <laughs> um, I'm pasteurized. So just to quickly cover that, um, I've already said about avoiding processed foods. So that includes foods that are high in added sugar, um, and foods that are high in added fat, sort of, um, high fat foods. I've mentioned the hydrogenated fats. So yeah, for safety reasons, choosing pasteurized dairy, avoiding blue cheeses and pate, avoiding dairy counter meats and fish and the salads that have been sat around. If you're going to buy a quiche, make sure you reheat it fully. It's not good to have smoked fish because obviously that's raw. Um, I'm going to talk about fish later, so I'll skip on from that one. Um, I'm going to talk about alcohol a bit more. It's advised to wash your fruits and vegetables. I know I can be quite lazy with that, <laughs> but it is advisable. Um, reheat your food thoroughly. Um, cook meat until it's really well done. So no raw steaks um, or, you know, rare steaks. <laughs> um, if you're traveling abroad, I think that's starting to happen now, yay. Um, but drink bottled water if you're not sure about the water supply. And then with eggs, um, as long as they've got the lion stamp on it, so the British stamp, um, then if they've got that stamp, it means they're safe to eat um, undercooked, you know, runny yolks. But if they haven't got the stamp, just making sure you cook them thoroughly. Otherwise, yeah, it's safe for pregnant women to have runny yolks, as long as they've got that stamp. So talking about alcohol, because it's, it's another really annoying area where there's not actually any clear yes or no guidance, but there is um, evidence that more than three units per week, so that's not all that much alcohol, um, in the first trimester can increase the risk of abortion. Um, so obviously that's tricky because some of us don't know we're pregnant when we're consuming that and there's nothing you can really do about that unless your pregnancy was planned which is why i said earlier on ideally reduce your alcohol intake if you're trying um so but my advice during pregnancy for most is to avoid it completely like we know that alcohol it doesn't have any health benefits for anyone so if you can avoid it for those roughly nine months whenever you find out um then that is the safest thing to do and i don't talk about it later but you can basically safely consume a small amount of alcohol when you're breastfeeding so it does mean that when you have given birth you can enjoy your a drink so it will only be for those nine months um and then with caffeine the advice is no more than 200 milligrams of caffeine a day and people that consume more than that, there is a risk of a low birth weight. Um, I've just put here for those one, trying to conceive that there's no f proven effect on male fertility um, and it's inclusive, uh, inconclusive for females with fertility. But as I said previously, I'd always recommend kind of reducing it pretty much in line with this recommendation, just so then when you do fall pregnant, you're already where you need to be. Um, so how much is that? Um, so this just shows you um, the 
the, the sources of caffeine, sorry, and roughly how much they contain. So as you can see, the monster energy drink, which um, lots of people do drink, um, contains nearly your full 200 milligrams. So 173 milligrams in one can. So I'd stay clear for many reasons. Um, decaf coffee still contains some caffeine. I think it's just useful to know, but it's such a small amount that you'd have to drink a lot of decaf coffee to reach your limit. So decaf coffee is perfectly safe. And in my opinion, doesn't taste any different. Um, so that's good. Um, and then tea is about 35 milligrams in a mug, in a typical mug. So that would be max about five mugs of tea um, a day. And a can of Coke there you can see is about the same. I've got company, sorry, no, 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 no. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, I do, I do, I love you, Paul. <laughs> sorry. Um, and um, interestingly, dark chocolate has more um, caffeine in it than, than a mug of tea. So 43 milligrams, but in 100 grams of dark chocolate. So that's, you know, the usual size of sort of one bar of small bar of dark chocolate. Um, which again, you, some people might eat. So it's just to be aware um, that it will contribute. And then if you're having espressos in your latte or what have you, um, then it's about 63 milligrams. So that's about three cups of regular coffee a day. So it's not that 200 milligrams is not tiny. Um, if you can still have five cups of tea a day or three espressos, then you, yeah, you're not, it's only for those that drink quite a lot <laughs> that need to worry about it. But obviously it does depend on your brewing method, the brand, um, so the strength that you like your tea, if you leave it to stew for a very long time, then the caffeine content is likely to be a bit higher than that. So you need to just sort of be aware. Um, and then also they'd add caffeine to things like cold and flu medicines. So just checking that when you're taking medicines, but I'm sure you're cautious about that anyway, when you're pregnant. Um, so yeah, you can enjoy your caffeinated tea and coffee without too much concern or guilt um other foods you can include so i've put peanuts there just i think again i think most people know now that you can eat peanuts in pregnancy but it's one of those ones in the past that they used to there used to be a bit of confusion over but obviously not if you're allergic you won't be eating them i put variety because again it just comes down to you know healthy eating a healthy diet really just comes down to as many different fruits and vegetables, as many different sources of protein, as many different whole grain carbohydrates. So brown rice, brown pasta, quinoa, um, like rye, um, all sorts of different, if you can eat lots of different nuts and seeds. So a handful of nuts is a portion. So if you can have a handful of nuts each day, that's going to like mixing up which types of nuts that's going to give you so many nutrients that you need um, for general health and for growing your baby. Um, also good to know that um, a baby's taste starts developing in the womb. So as early as 16 weeks, they can taste and swallow the amniotic fluid. So you're already shaping their taste preferences and their food habits for later life which is incredible from 16 weeks, I think. Um, so don't shy away from eating the curry or whatever you like, you know, herbs and spices. Same advice for general public is, you know, to reduce your salt intake. So if you can use herbs and spices to flavor your food and reduce your salt intake, that's gonna be beneficial. So some women have higher blood pressure in pregnancy. So even more important to reduce your salt intake in that instance. Um, so yeah, using different herbs and spices, they can be fresh or dried, um, is a good way to get flavor into your food. Um, and the baby will enjoy it as well. Um, so just focusing on fish for a moment. So I've already said that fish is a good source of the omega-3 fatty acids, but it also gives us choline, selenium, iron, zinc, copper, and, um, 
I haven't put it there because I'm talking more specifically about oily fish, but white fish is really good for iodine as well, which is important for the brain. Um, and so, yeah, your, your oily fish is a source of omega-3s and omega-6s, so they're both um, types of fatty acids that, that we that have so many uses um, in the body, so growth, development, cell function, your heart health, your immune system, um, your nerve cells, it's all, yeah, all listed here. Yeah, um, you've got omega-3s and 6s in your brain, so um, affecting your brain structure, and so therefore affecting baby's brain structure. Um, and also in the gray matter of your brain. So intelligent babies, if you eat plenty of, uh, if you have enough omega-3, um, and then also in your eye. So um, DHA, which is docosahexaenoic acid. So one of the omega-3s that is found in the photoreceptor membrane in the retina of your eye. So for eyesight as well, it's very important. Um, so, um, but there are some limitations, which I've summarized on the next, next bit. So the recommendation is two fish per week. So you could have one white fish, so non oily, um, and one oily fish a week. If you want to make them both oily, the recommendation is not to have more than two oily a week. So oily includes salmon, trout, mackerel and sardines. So um, fresh tuna used to be on the list. And I did see a Tommy's uh, leaflet the other day um, about fish and they still had fresh tuna on it as a source of omega threes, but it's not uh, considered that anymore. Just to clarify that. Um, but with tuna, if, for eating in terms of um, kind of food safety, um, not in terms of just in general of eating fish, not to do with omega threes, um, but the recommendation is not to have more than two tuna steaks a week or four tins of tuna um, because of the mercury levels in the fish. So often people are quite concerned and scared uh, when they hear the word mercury and mercury poisoning, and there's lots of negative um, news kind of when you Google about the toxins in fish. Um, but all of the benefits that I've mentioned and all this, the roles that the omega threes have far outweigh um, the risk as long as you're following these recommendations. So as well as limiting the tuna, it's to avoid swordfish, marlin, shark, and raw shellfish, which I don't think is that difficult <laughs> in the UK to avoid. Um, so I say, if you like fish um, and you want to include it in your diet, you can do so without worrying. Um, and it kind of, yeah, it's a slightly off topic, but I, in terms of, it's just, it's down to your choice, but I would always advise sustainable fish because obviously that's another conversation about fish stocks and how we farm fish or catch fish. So if you can buy sustainably, yeah, I would definitely recommend that, but it's a slightly different <laughs> topic. Um, so moving on from fish, um, morning sickness. So if anyone's listening, um, and they're suffering from morning sickness or someone that's not pregnant and is worried about morning sickness or later suffers from it, um, briefly covering that it's up to 20% of women will have morning sickness that persists beyond 20 weeks. So it's actually quite a high percentage, like one in five women will really suffer with morning sickness. Um, so it's, yeah very unpleasant for them. Um, it isn't normal for morning sickness to occur for the first time after 12 weeks. So if you feel like you're, if you're being sick or very nauseous after 12 weeks, then do go to your GP. Uh, hyperemesis, hyperemesis gravidarum um, is defined when you can't even keep fluids down and usually uh, will be sort of diagnosed uh, formally if you've lost um, 
five percent or more of your pre-pregnancy body weight so say you're not sort of considered to have it unless you're losing weight at the same time so if you're baby's growing and you're gaining some weight, then you're sort of evidently kind of getting enough food on board in terms of energy. It doesn't mean that what you're eating is necessarily um, ideal in terms of what I've just covered, but that's okay. So it's really difficult to, to do any of what I've just said if you're feeling sick and you've got really bad morning sickness. And if it continues through pregnancy, it's can be very draining. Um, and if that's you, um, I've put it at the bottom of, of here, but there is the pre pregnancy sickness support website, um, the charity, and they've got a website to so do if that is you go go onto there and um, have a look at that. Um, and if you were worried about your nutrition because of severe morning sickness, then so say getting a one to one um, dietitian appointment would be advisable as well. But if it's just general morning sickness, um, then here's some tips. So trying to stay in bed um, when you first wake in the morning. So rising slowly. So we don't tend to do that. We, um, when we're busy in the middle of the working week, we tend to kind of pull ourselves out of bed fairly, fairly quickly once we've woken up. Um, but trying to just slow down a little bit and maybe keeping some dry snacks by the side of your bed. So something like a cream cracker or a digestive biscuit, if you want to something sweeter um, and to having that before you even, you know, you have to be a little bit upright to eat it. But before you sit fully up, having a snack, um, eating regular small meals usually can help because sometimes when we don't eat, that actually makes us feel more nauseous. So regular small meals and snacks, sometimes the smell of lemon can help settle it, eating ginger, getting fresh air. I've already put about, the, I already said about dry snacks in the morning, but yeah, carrying them in your handbag or whatever. So you've always got them at hand and so that you can have that regular snack to keep it at bay, carrying a plastic bag. I, I, yeah, that's just a general tip <laughs> just so that you're prepared, nothing food related. Um, Eating cold foods can sometimes help because it's the smell of foods that really uh, brings it on. Sipping ice cold water can help, but in general, try and avoid drinking really close to a meal or with a meal. Um, avoiding strong flavors, so that's why uh, cold food can be better, but just in general, maybe sometimes it's difficult to be the person cooking the food because of the smells, so you need someone else to maybe cook for you. Um, that would be good. Um, and then sucking on ice lollies um, or frozen watermelon. If you can tolerate dairy and you eat dairy, um, then you can use it to fortify food. So, you know, you might add um, some cheese on top of something or um, use full fat milk, for example, so that you're getting the energy from foods, because if you're not eating as much, then you want your food to be higher in energy um, than we normally you know, on healthy eating terms, we would advise. Try to take a pregnancy vitamin in this instance. So it might help to take it before bed, maybe when you're gonna lie down, or you might tolerate it better with food, so you have to experiment. Um, but if you can't tolerate it, try and at least take separate folic acid um, until it passes. Um, rest, that's easier said than done sometimes, but really important and lying down regularly can help. And then seek GP support to say there are different anti sickness medications and some work better for some people than others. So trying different ones is really so, you know, if you get given one on prescription, it doesn't work, doesn't mean there isn't another alternative. And then I've mentioned that charity at the bottom for further advice. I have a question, Ruth. Yeah. Um, is a multivitamin recommended throughout pregnancy or only if you struggle to get the vitamins naturally? Yeah, so um, as I was saying, you should be able to get most of your nutrients through diet, the exception being that you do need the folic acid and you do need vitamin D. Um, otherwise, there's no actual necessity for multivitamins, but there's no harm either. Um, so it's kind of personal choice. Um, but uh, yeah, I've said earlier on, um, but I'll just reiterate that maybe you've got a slightly limited diet for some reason, or um, yeah, maybe you don't eat animal products. So then um, there's some other considerations 
and you might want to take a, a supplement for those reasons. I can share my slides afterwards, um, but yeah, because it was all mentioned before about um, like for vegans, if you maybe don't, you, I would always recommend a B12 supplement for vegans, whether they're pregnant or not, to be honest. Um, so yeah, B12, but also iodine, the B2, the riboflavin, um, yeah, those one. And then iron supplements are a, diff a difficult one because they can cause constipation. Um, so you don't want high dose iron supplements unless you really need them, unless their GP has prescribed them and you actually have no iron. But um, yeah, I it would be more about if you're worried you're not getting the nutrients, I say either, you know, speaking to a dietitian or as, as I said, go on to the BDA fact sheets. Look, there'll be a fact sheet about calcium, about iron, about B12, and you can look and see the foods that contain them and assess for yourself. Am I getting these enough? Am I eating enough of them on a regular basis to get what I need? Or do I need to take the supplement? Because taking the supplement would seem like the easy solution, but we just then you don't get the benefits of the whole food. So I'd always try and get it through diet first. Um, because you'll be getting all the fiber and other goodness with it. So, sorry, long, long answer. <laughs> um, so moving on to reflux quickly. Um, so uh, just quickly to say, yeah, reflux or heartburn is quite a common thing in pregnancy too. So again, eating little and often, try to leave three hours before you go to bed. So not snacking in the evening can really help. Um, eating slowly. Lying on your left side is kind of recommended anyway um, in the third trimester of pregnancy, but basically our esophagus, so our the food pipe goes to our right hand side of our stomach. So if we lie on our left, all the contents of our stomach shifts to the left away from that connection, so it can help. Um, and then I've put the common triggers there, spicy food, fatty foods, chocolate, Sometimes tomatoes for some people, fizzy drinks. So you might want to keep a food diary to see what are your what foods make it worse for you, and trying to have plenty of fiber and um, water to drink so that you don't get constipated because that will make it worse. Um, so I'm only on the second trimester, but I, it, it's not as lengthy now. <laughs> um, so your second trimester, um, obviously, if you've been feeling nauseous, this is your chance to focus on everything I've talked about and eating regular meals, trying to get a balance, as I said before, between those different food groups. So not excluding anything, not excluding carbohydrates. I missed my opportunity maybe to say it earlier, but you know, pregnancy is not the time to try and lose weight. So just trying to have everything in moderation, which is very boring, but very true. <laughs> um, but yeah, not excluding carbohydrates or anything to try and to lose weight. Um, I've said about limiting processed food, um, that will be the best way to avoid excessive weight gain, um, portion sizes as well. So making sure you're having a little, I said moderation already, but you know, if you're, you're worried about not wanting to gain too much in pregnancy, having a little bit of everything on your plate will be the best way to go about it. Um, and the second trimester is when you may start developing gestational diabetes um so our bodies become more resistant to that insulin that i mentioned at the beginning the hormone that helps us get sugar out of our blood into our cells um it's a it's it's a natural thing that happens um in pregnancy some women are more at risk than others unfortunately the older we get the more at risk we are so if you're having a geriatric pregnancy as they like, the lovely terminology that they use you may be more at risk um, but you'll be you'll be monitored and tested for it. But um, I say it tends to rear its head in the second trimester. So if you can be sort of focusing on good eating habits in that time, then you can hopefully avoid it or better control it. If you because sometimes sometimes nothing you do can prevent it, but you can help manage it and keep your blood sugars steadier by managing it through diet and avoid going on to insulin injections. Um, in the third trimester, our metabolism shifts to promote the use of that fat that we were storing early on. Um, and um, then 
lots of the the sugars and the um so we use the the fat sorry for our energy and then the carbohydrates that we're eating the sugars that we're consuming and the protein goes straight to the fetus because they want to put on some weight um and so that's why in the final trimester their energy requirements do increase um which means hours um so, but it's only 200 calories a day, roughly for most people. So that's the equivalent of like two slices of bread without anything on them, um, or maybe an apple and a couple of crackers, again, with nothing on them, um, or for point of reference for a four finger Kit Kat. Um, so it's not that much more. So the, as I said before, the whole eating for two really isn't that much more, um, it's 200 calories. Um, and then, this is when the omega threes are really important for the development of the baby's brain. Um, so if yeah, you think, oh, I haven't been eating my having my omega threes, and you're at the end of your pregnancy, this is the time to be having them. So it's not too late. Um, so I've already said oily fish once a week, or get the walnuts, linseed, chia seeds, and hemp seeds I mentioned as well here in um, at this point. Um, and then moving on swiftly uh, away from being pregnant just a little bit about maybe what you want to prepare for the birth so you might want some food for your hospital bag so these are just my recommendations um doesn't mean you have to have these specific things but maybe something like muesli bars so obviously if you're packing your bag you want things that aren't going to spoil in there so muesli bars might be good um there's always the wonderful tea and toast after you've given birth, but maybe if that's delayed for some reason, like you could have a muesli bar after birth as well. Um, during labor, things like jelly babies or similar, something that's just sugar is actually really beneficial because if you have a long labor, it's like doing an endurance run. Um, it's like running a marathon at least. And so you don't wanna be digesting some like hard to chew food you just want a bit of sugar to keep your energy levels up so having something like that can be can be useful um chocolate again maybe you prefer chocolate but yeah if you've had a really long labor maybe after the labor um it might have been a long time since you ate a meal and you just you need some energy um these are the, you know, say so this is when I'm recommending chocolate and sweets. Um, but if you want something, maybe you're not in hard labor, maybe your contractions are quite far apart, and but you don't really want to sit and have a meal, you might have something like crackers or oat cakes, rice cakes, something savory like that in there. Um, like you can get those cheesy oat cakes or something, you know, with a bit of flavor that you might um, add in, all the different flavored rice cakes, those kind of carbs. They're, if they're whole grain ones as well, they're more, that energy is going to be more slow, slowly released. So they, that could be beneficial for a longer labor. And uh, some fruit. So that might be, you might just kind of think, oh, I'm going to make sure I've got fruit in the house towards the end of my pregnancy so that before we go, we can shove a banana in or apple or something. Um, but that could be a good snack. And maybe even a sandwich if uh, you go into labor and you've got some time. Uh, maybe your partner or even yourself could make a sandwich because say if it's a long burning kind of labor you'll have time <laughs> to do that but it, otherwise at the beginning of labor you might you know you probably have time to sit and eat a meal if your contractions aren't too bad at the beginning it really depends how it how it pans out but um yeah this is more about things that you can pop in the in the hospital bag and then i put don't forget about fluids too because imagine you're in labor for over a day um, you really want to stay hydrated, especially if you're planning to breastfeed, you know, you need your body needs to be hydrated for that. And if you're if you get dehydrated during childbirth, you're going to feel really rotten afterwards because you're just going to be feeling very tired with hydrate dehydration and maybe a headache and things. Um, and personally, I've um, packed isotonic fluids. So that's like your Lucasade Sport. Um, so like the blue one. Um, so that's like the perfect fluid for keeping you hydrated. It's got the electrolytes in it and a bit of energy as well. So I just sipped that because I had long labors. <laughs> um, so you might want to put a bottle of that in your bag as well. Um, and then the fourth trimester. So that's the um, period of your baby being a newborn. So the first 12 weeks. So 
obviously goes without saying that you're going to be quite tired so you want foods that keep your energy levels up so it's quite normal to crave sugary foods um when you've got a newborn you know and you're very tired but if you can try and make um healthy-ish choices during this period as well so going for whole grains again having some carbohydrate and making your snacks count as well so you might not have so much time for sitting down uh, for regular meals but if you have a snack try and include some carbohydrates some protein and some healthy fats so you might have some cream cheese on a cracker or some avocado or some peanut butter on toast um so something like that that's so it's not just a biscuit um it's something that's actually going to fill you up and give you energy for a period of time try and again fluids are important so try and keep water by the bed maybe put a few bottles around the house where you might be feeding the baby so that when you sit down you don't have to you don't get stuck sitting there without a drink which is quite common um especially if you're breastfeeding you will probably feel quite thirsty um and then i've put here foods to help baby sleep just because that's something that comes up in different settings so people talk about tryptophan rich foods um, to help baby sleep there's more evidence needed but if you wanted to give it a try um it's things like poultry salmon eggs and then spinach seeds milk um nuts and seeds they're kind of some of the main main sources so by poultry i mean chicken and other things like turkey um so yeah you could give them a whirl um and i put the omega-3s again so the omega-3s still are important because they're important for melatonin which is the hormone that helps regulate our sleep um i've put here breastfeeding for the first six months protects babies and mum's health so i'm not going to go into breastfeeding i think most people know the breast is best kind of mantra what i would say is that if you struggle in any way um, to breastfeed and it's something that you do want to do um, then i would definitely seek out a lactation consultant or a peer support group as soon as possible so obviously the nest has support groups um, but yeah you can get free support widely around the devon area now which is amazing because they it didn't used to be maybe as good as it is now um, and so yeah, you can go very early on um, or even have a phone call with someone that will give you some advice and help you um, breastfeed. So it's, it's something that you want to get that advice as soon as possible um, and maybe even go to those groups when you're pregnant and sort of learn as much as possible about breastfeeding and the different techniques so that, yeah, you're prepared before you got a screaming baby and you're very tired. Um, and and then also in this trimester obviously it's very early days and you're not thinking about having another child i don't think for most people but in the post pre post birth period if you are thinking you're going to have another child what you eat now is then going to be in preparation for that next baby um which is it's kind of a crazy not something you really think about but basically advice is to leave between 18 months and two years between pregnancies so for some people it doesn't happen that way for some people they kind of need to get on with it quicker for other reasons but ideally you leave that period and that is about your body recovering and all those nutrients that i've talked about all this your own body stores building back up and you eating the right food to get yeah to get the best to your best health you can for that next child so I say it's not something that I expect you to be thinking about, but I've just put it there as a, a fact. Um, and then preparing, sort of preparing for that fourth trimester, I would definitely ask friends and family to bring around cooked meals um, and snacks like flapjack or something that will give you lots of energy. Um, you could maybe sign up to a meal delivery offer um, or suggest it as a gift, even better. You could schedule a supermarket delivery with all the things that you've missed eating um you could start batch cooking before your pregnancy before your birth um ready for the fourth trimester um i've said during the fourth trimester eat when you can so if you're not used to having a hot meal at lunchtime you might decide i'm going to have something hot now because baby's asleep um, at lunchtime 
Um, I found a wrap type of sling a lifesaver um, because I had a cranky <laughs> first child, I had cranky two, second child too, but cranky first child that didn't that like to be put down. Um, and so I had the sling that you could just keep the sling on you, bring them out and in whenever you needed to. So it'll give you your hands free to prepare cold foods. Obviously I've not said cooking something at the stove, that would be quite dangerous, but you can at least prepare something cold, like a sandwich, and also it helps you just to eat your food as well, because you guarantee that baby will decide they want to be picked up just as you're tucking into your meal. I've done many meals with a napkin over the baby's head, so I don't drop food on them. Um, you might have it uh, accessible to you to hire a postnatal doula. This is again, something that I, I don't think was that uh, prevalent when I had mine, um, but they will cook you a meal if you want to. They'll do whatever you <laughs> whatever you need to support you. Um, so I think that sounds amazing to have someone come around and even just make you a cup of tea. Um, and I've put take the opportunity to eat out because if it's your first child, when they're a newborn, when you get to the point of wanting to leave the house, it's really easy to take them out for meals. Um, and yeah, so you can kind of like once they're a little bit older, they'll need to be in their bed. But when they're little, you can take them out with you and still enjoy eating out. So make the most of it still worse you can. A um, little bit on breastfeeding here. Just um, again, I've put that your body stores will be used to provide um, some of that nutrition. So some people worry that nutrition to baby, sorry. So some people worry that their breast milk isn't adequate in some way, it doesn't have enough energy in it or enough nutrients and baby's hungry, but breast milk will always have what it needs in it. So even if you just ate toast, that breast milk would have everything baby needs in it because it gets the main nutrients from your body stores. That's not to say you should just eat toast, but it's just to take that worry away from you because your breast milk will always be at its optimum, you will be the one that suffers. So you're the reason that you need to eat well. Um, so it's all the sort of same nutrients that I've been talking about before, um, but just to say the vitamin D supplement should be taken when you're breastfeeding still. So 10 micrograms a day, but you also should be giving 10 micrograms a day to baby. So you get the vitamin D drops and you can drop it onto your nipple before they feed. If babies, having more than 500 mils of formula, they don't need vitamin D supplements, um, but it's, yeah, for mostly exclusively breastfed babies at this point, vitamin D. Um, and I've just put their lactation cookies aren't scientifically proven. There's no evidence that they help you to produce breast milk. They're not dissimilar to other biscuits. So you could have any biscuit you want. Um, and that's where I've put as well that you you should, yeah, if, if you're struggling to breastfeed, you probably do need some energy, but you can get that through whatever source of food you 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 want. Um, but yeah, getting advice is better. And then I put lots of colourful photos because, again, same when you're pregnant as when you're um, if you post baby in that fourth trimester and beyond. You just want to be eating the rainbow, have as much variety as possible. I'm not going to start listing nutrients again, but yeah. Um, there's just things to capture your mind there that I've already um, covered. And then quickly, a few words about your post baby body. Um, obviously, lots of people after um, the birth will be wanting to get back um, their, po their pre pregnancy body, which I don't know if you will ever get back your pre pregnancy body. Um, but I would say it shouldn't be a consideration um, until at least probably tight nine months down the line because there's a general sort of saying uh, nine months in nine at least nine months out to kind of give yourself time to just be and enjoy your baby and not worry about any of that stuff um, you might have i've said diastasis recti which is the separation of the stomach muscles um, or pelvic floor issues which there's more of next week. So tune in next week for everything about the pelvic floor. Um, but I would say 
you want to really learn to appreciate everything your body's done for you. So following, there's lots of people on social media now that are very willing to take photos of their post baby bodies. So it's really good to look at them and to see the reality um, of, of it for some people and to <clears throat> practice not comparing, which goes for everything when it comes to having a baby, not comparing uh, to other people and other people's babies, but um, yeah, trying to not compare your post baby uh, body experience with other people's because it's going to be very different um and hopefully you can learn yeah say learn to appreciate what your body has been through what it's done for you what it does for your baby um and maybe even love it which is the harder bit to do um but um yeah sort of weight loss basically and how you uh how sort of toned you are uh, shouldn't be a consideration for a for a good while but that doesn't mean to say that you know you won't lose the weight or get some muscle tone back but um yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't worry about it basically um and then not forgetting the partners very quickly here that uh pregnancy um is also a good period for them to establish good eating habits so their eating habits are going to affect the child's eating habits later on as well so maybe if your partner's eating habits aren't wonderful they may not be carrying a baby but they could still support you and change their habits during this period as well. Um, maybe if you're the main cook in the house, you want to kind of spend some time teaching them to cook a few key dishes um, that they can then do um, regularly afterwards, or you might do some meal planning with them. I say sometimes um, it might not be you that does the cooking, so that might be irrelevant, but for those with partners that don't cook, you know, you want to instill that habit now. Um, and then quickly to say that you're entitled to free dental care and your increased risk of gum disease and tooth decay. And even though I've talked about all the good foods that you should eat, you still probably will eat quite a lot of biscuits at all the mum groups that you go to. Um, so looking after your teeth is important. Um, and then there's just a few ideas there about sort of meal prep, things that you can put in the cupboard, freezer, fridge, so that you, yeah, I've got things to pull on. So I've put things like sachets of cooked rice and lentils. They're quite you know, prevalent in the supermarket now, like all those nuts and seeds, nut butters that I've talked about being good for you, crackers. You can put pita breads in the freezer, um, maybe make a batch of scones or something and put them in. Um, maybe make some soup, put that, put that in. So yeah, lots of ideas there if you need them. Um, I'll leave that up for a moment. Um, but that is the end of my presentation. It was a lot of information. I hope I haven't um, overwhelmed you all. Uh, but I'm happy to give you a copy of the slide so you can read it all back. I say there was quite a lot about certain nutrients and the sources of those nutrients. So you might want to look back at those. Um, but as I said, you can email me um, if you've got any specific questions that come out of this you want advice about supplements or something okay i will stop sharing